Hi boys and girls, story time again. Uh, it's kind of a overcast Thursday afternoon. i am uh, got a day off and we're, I think we're at episode 8 of A Journey where we've been reading from the book A Journey. Uh, Rukar Doggy and I just came back uh, from the grocery store. Uh, we'll be making falafel tonight. Um, wish you were here. They're, I, they're probably going to be pretty good. Speaking of Ruka, uh, day before yesterday, she and I were having a wonderful walk out in the woods. Uh, same trail we were at. I mentioned it in, a, in a, one of these little episodes of, of some time ago. Beautiful little trail through the woods. Yeah, you know, it ends up at a kind of a service road that's overgrown. So we'd been out walking about an hour on the trail and on the service road. And I'd let Ruka off her lead because she loves to just run. She's crazy up there. Um, she just runs like a deer, which is amazing because she's had two torn ACLs that have miraculously healed. Uh, she's getting kind of old. She's 13. She doesn't hear real well, and I'm thinking she doesn't see real well. Her eyes are getting a little bit cloudy. So we were, uh, she had been running back and forth. She ran by me, was heading towards where we had ended up, where at the end of the trail. And uh, it was, you know, a minute or so had gone by, and I started calling her. I thought she would just come back. She didn't. So I started walking that direction, calling the whole time, and walked nearly as far as we had been. I mean, it was, you know, probably maybe 10 minutes walking on the trail, calling, and she's not coming. So then I'm starting to think, well, what's the deal? Did she somehow get by me? And is she walking back towards the car? Um, so I turned around, headed back towards the car, calling the whole time, um, mostly kind of downhill, getting back to the car, and no Ruka, nowhere to be found. So this is like 45 minutes now of calling for her in the woods and not finding her. So I got my phone out of the car and called Carol to let her know that I may have lost Ruka in the woods. Yeah, that's a pretty horrible thing to have to tell your wife. And then decided, okay, well, I got to go back and walk towards the end of the trail where we had been. Um, so I started that, calling her and walking. And about halfway there, uh, here comes Ruka, sheepishly. I think kind of knowing she, you know, I had no idea. I didn't. I don't know if she'd stroked out or had a heart attack or you know went chasing after a deer in the woods. But I never heard a thing. Um, and so here she was. So I was a very grateful boy. And uh, we're so glad to have Ruka. Now she's, that night, yes, or that evening, neither of us were able to walk very well. Uh, my joints were aching. I know hers were. But I'm so happy that Ruka's still with us. I'll be more diligent now when we're out walking. And, uh, and it also made me think, uh, a friend suggested today to maybe put a chip on her, or at the very least, we'll put a collar on her with her identification on it, uh, in case she does get lost sometime. So anyway, today we're reading uh, chapter 10 of A Journey, Go West, Young Man. You know, we had just been um, in Israel on kibbutz. And now Peter and I were uh, doing a little traveling together. So looking at chapter 10, Go West, Young Man. And it reads as follows. Both Peter and I had been thinking it was about time to leave Israel. Neither of us knew exactly where he was going, so we decided to go together. After flying from Tel Aviv to Athens, we took the opportunity to visit the Parthenon, as well as the other ancient monuments that sit atop the Acropolis. Pretty amazing to hang out on the steps of a structure that's been around for more than 400 years before Jesus was born. 
It was very cool. Peter had stayed in Athens before, so he was familiar with a cheap hostel where we could sleep on the rooftop. They even had a friendly box turtle that lived up on the roof. We both needed to save money so there were no fancy Greek meals eaten by either of us while in Athens. There was, however, the most wonderful yogurt that on more than one occasion we enjoyed along with some delicious fresh-baked bread. The yogurt almost seemed like it had, had a thin layer of cheese on top. It was yummy. Even though Greek yogurt seems to be all the rage in the States these days, I have never since eaten anything quite like what we had in Greece. Somebody told us uh, that one way to make a little money while in Athens was to sell blood. We also heard that when you did, you would be given a glass of orange juice. Funny how motivating and how good that glass of orange juice sounded at the time. We did sell blood, but wouldn't you know it, nary a glass of OJ to be had. I'm guessing we went to the wrong place. Oh well, we were both about $13 richer for selling the blood. That's until we came upon what looked like a great way to increase our earnings. Three-card Monty, although a con game that has been used to fleece foolish people like me for many hundreds of years, it apparently dates back to the 15th century and may even have been adapted from a shell game that was used to rip off unsuspecting marks or patsies or suckers in ancient Greece. Around for hundreds of years, and yet not something that either Peter or I had ever seen before. I'm quite sure that the guy handling the cards, along with his accomplices, saw the smoke from our hard-earned blood money burning a hole in our pockets from a block away. The point of the game is to guess which of the three cards is the queen, kind of like guessing which shell the pea is under. The gentleman with the card shows you all three, turns them over, mixes them up a little, and then picks them up one on top of the other. He then throws them down in a line, face down. You, or in this case me, simply has to pick the one believed to be the queen. That is, after betting on your pick. The part that you don't know, or in this case I didn't know, is that when the dealer is throwing the cards down, he may or may not be throwing them down in order. You think he's throwing down the bottom, then middle, then top card, but he may be throwing down the card from the top when you just think it's a card from the bottom. The point is, try as hard as you like, you can never know for sure where the queen is. And to make matters worse, he, he lets you witness a few rounds where someone actually does win the game. Unfortunately, and unbeknownst to us, or in this case, unbeknownst to Peter and I, the guy you watched win the game is working together with Mr. Three Card Monty Man. When all was said and done, I lost my $13. And to make things worse, Peter got caught up in my enthusiasm to make some easy money and laid his earnings down as well. And not even a glass of orange juice. Dang it. Journal entry continued. Monday. April 4th. Yesterday we went to the Acropolis and saw the Parthenon and all those good things. Athens is a very beautiful place. I'm very thankful to be here as well as everywhere else I've been in the last few months. Now Peter and I will try a little bit of traveling. Just exactly where, we'll have to see. Wednesday, 4.13. Now sitting in the train station of Savona, former home of Christopher Columbus, which is in Italy. The pen is running out of ink. Peter and I took the boat from the north of Greece to Bari. From there, we hitched and took a train to Rome. I think I'll finish for now because no more ink. Bari is located just about where the heel of Italy's boots meets the shoe. The landscape in that part of the country is absolutely beautiful, to be sure. Trying to hitch a ride from there to Rome, however, 
would prove to be a little more of an adventure than we anticipated. Winding narrow mountainous roads can definitely be a unique and awesome sight. They can also be kind of scary when the driver of one of your rides thinks he's competing in a race. I remember Peter quietly saying to me, this guy thinks he's Sterling Moss. Mr. Moss was a former Formula One race car driver from England. We ended up telling our gracious but crazy driver that he could let us out sooner than we had originally agreed upon. After being dropped off, and after thanking God that we were still alive, we decided to catch a train for the remainder of the trip to Rome. Journal entry, Friday, 4.15. The first night in Rome, we tried to stay on a, in the train station, but we were moved out about 1.30 in the morning. We were then forced to pay a whole lot for a pension. So, yeah, if you didn't have a ticket to ride the train, they kicked you out. We ended up paying way more than we could afford for a guest house. Considering we had arrived in Rome the day before Easter, we were probably pretty fortunate to find anywhere to stay at all, especially at 1.30 in the morning. Now back to the journal entry. The second night was great. We stayed in a big park, Villa Borghese. In the park, there is a little lake, and on the lake, a little house with a statue. It made a perfect hotel. In the midst of the busy metropolis of Rome lies the city's largest park, the Villa Borghese. On the shore of a little lake in the park sits the temple of Oscalapius or Oscalapius. It just so happens that there is room to lie down your sleeping bag next to the statue of good old Oscalapius. He is apparently the Roman god of medicine or healing, and he was kind enough to share his temple with Peter and me. We were a little surprised to wake up in the morning with people rowing around the lake in little boats. After quickly picking up and saying goodbye to Oscalapius, we spent the day exploring Rome. Having grown, grown up in a Baptist church, and with the exception of visiting a few Catholic churches that some of my friends went to, I really didn't know a lot, a lot about Catholicism, although there was the friendly priest in Ireland. I was, however, very interested in visiting the Vatican. We actually slightly considered trying to visit on Easter Sunday, but decided that was probably a bad, if not impossible, idea. The day after Easter, on the other hand, we were able to visit the Vatican without a huge crowd. I was half hoping that Pope Paul VI uh, might be having a little downtime and perhaps we would bump into each other and maybe enjoy a cappuccino oh, and a little conversation. You know, it could happen. We didn't get to chat with the Pope but we did visit the Sistine Chapel and get to see Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Pretty cool. Back to the journal. Well, after another night in Rome, we hitched as far as Genoa, then took a train to Savona. From there, we jumped on a train to Paris, and that's where we are now. It's really good to be here. On our way out of Rome, we thought it only natural that we should enjoy a plate of Italian spaghetti. We stopped into a little restaurant, and I must say, the spaghetti was delicious. Also particularly tasty was the bowl full of fresh grated Parmesan cheese that was also on the table. In addition to heaping it on our spaghetti, we may have, no, we did, eat it by the spoonful. We may have even... No, we did. Eat the whole bowl. Having put our already licked spoons back in the bowl, we felt sort of obligated to eat it all. We didn't make it very far that first day when trying to hitchhike up the coast from Rome. After standing in the rain for quite some time without a ride, we decided to walk toward the beach and look for a place to set up the tent. We came to what looked like a private campground where you would likely be expected to pay. The site was surrounded by a high chain link fence, but considering that it wasn't that it was getting late in the day and considering it was not a time of year when anybody else was camping, we thought it might be okay to climb over the fence and set up the tent for the night. 
I think it might have been a little foggy that afternoon because we never did notice the big house with, that was just up the beach from where we were. We did become very aware of the house the next day, however, after being woken up by the sounds of voices and barking dogs. Outside the tent was the proprietor of the camping ground, along with perhaps his adult son, and two quite large and quite excited dogs. By the, by the tone of their voices and considering that the older gentleman was carrying a shotgun, it was pretty clear that they didn't appreciate our trespassing. And my lovely wife Carol just came in the door. Carol, did you want to come say hi? No, thank you. <laughs> she won't do that. Chicken. <laughs> they managed to communicate that they were indeed that we were indeed expected to pay for our cold, rainy campsite on the beach. The two men were using pretty loud voices, and the dogs were getting so excited that they started to nip at our legs. Although, although we were only able to exchange a few words in English, the younger of the two gentlemen did understand my suggestion that they take their excited dogs back to the house while Peter and I packed up our camp. We would then come to the home and settle up. Surprisingly, they agreed to do this and left us standing at the tent as they walked back to the house. So here we were with a decision to make. Do we finish packing up and then walk to the house of the guy with the shotgun and two dogs that want to bite us? Or do we finish packing up and quickly climb over the fence and run away? We went with run away. Fortunately, we were able to catch a ride at the highway without having to get to wait very long. And fortunately, the guys and their dogs must have decided that it wasn't worth chasing after us in the rain. That day we made it as far as Genoa, and from there caught a train to Savona and then on to Paris. Along the way we passed by the town of Pisa, and although we didn't stop, we did at least look in the direction of the leaning tower. Journal entry continued, Friday, 4.15. We are now sitting in Lopez's house. Lopez was the cousin of Soazic, the lovely bride whose wedding I attended in France. He'd made the mistake of inviting me to visit, if ever, in the area. If you invite Tim, he will come, and he might even bring a friend. Just washed some clothes and had a shower, and I'm feeling really good. Yesterday, when we arrived in Paris, we went to Ronnie's, but he had moved. Going to try and get in touch with him to get the 250 francs, because I'm broke. Whenever imposing on friends or relatives and staying in their homes, I tried to help out with chores or contribute to the house fund or both. Some months prior while staying in Paris with Ronnie, in addition to contributing to the house fund, I also loaned him 250 francs, about $50, with the assurance that he would pay me back someday. I never really wanted or expected to get reimbursed for that little loan, and yet, here I was, yes, wanting to pay Ronnie a visit, but also very much intending to ask for the money. We never did find out where Ronnie had moved to. Journal entry, Tuesday, 829. Well, it's been a while. Peter and I had a good time in Paris. Never did get in touch with Ronnie, but we did stay with Lopez and Anne. Anne was sister to Lopez. We also saw Bridget and Henry again, friends from the Puck Fair in Calorglin. It was all great. We went to London from Paris, by boat and then train. We saw Sean for a couple days, and to make a long story short, I came home. I'm not going to write a lot about what's happened between then and now, except that tonight I thought Nicholas was gone. Nicholas was my great cat that I, I thought had gone missing. Thank you so much, Lord, for an opportunity to feel so fantastic after having felt so bad. He was sleeping under the sink for about an hour and a half. Thanks so much. Kind of like yesterday when I found Ruka. I was very grateful. 
After, our, after making our way from Israel to London, Peter and I both had to figure out what was coming next. While in London, we dropped in on our old friend Sean, who had finished his working vacation on the kibbutz and returned to his job managing a pub. Sean was kind enough to invite us to crash at his place while we decided on future plans. Considering that my finances were getting seriously low, I determined that it might be a time to return to the States. The last 11 months had been such an incredible experience, and although I was thinking about going home, I also knew that my traveling days were certainly not over. For now, though, it would just mean returning to Washington and seeing where the road would lead from there. Peter had decided to remain in London for a while and look for a job in a pub. His plan was to then return to New Zealand, but to make the trip via the USA. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, let's see, where were we? Via the USA. I said goodbye to Sean and to Peter and then jumped on a plane, destination Seattle, Washington. Turns out this would not be the last time that Peter and I would see each other. All right, that concludes chapter 10. Go west, young man. Um, this next go round, which we might even do today, uh, but I won't do it right now. Uh, 33rd and South Sawyer. So thanks, everybody, anybody, uh, if you happen to see this and hear this. Um, I got to say it is fun to do. And um, for those of you who like to listen to books rather than read them, Maybe it's maybe it works for you too. So until next time, adios.